Hello everyone, and welcome back. This week's video is a quick dive into the standard issue infantry weapons fielded by the Axis powers of World War II, as voted by you all a few weeks back. Regardless of if you're new here or coming back for another video, I hope you enjoy and maybe learn something new. Stick around until the end if you want to hear about upcoming projects and how you can be involved in what content you see on the channel. But for now, onto the video. Despite the very commonly overhyped advancements made by the Germans in technology during World War II, the majority of their infantry would find themselves equipped with the Karabiner 98 Kurtz, better known by its abbreviation, the Kar 98K. Similar to the majority of bolt actions in use at this time, it was an updated variant of an older rifle, the Kar being an evolution of the Imperial German Gewehr 98 bolt action rifle. Chambered in 792 by 57 Mauser, the car feeds from a 5 round internal magazine loaded with stripper clips, and is designed to be accurate at up to 500 meters with its iron sights. The car 98 would be effective at the start of the war, especially as an accessory to the Blitzkrieg style of warfare that captured vast swaths of European territory. But as the Soviets and Americans began equipping their infantry with semi-automatic and fully automatic weapons as standard, the bolt-action Kar 98K became rapidly less effective in combat. Issues with material and production capabilities in Germany as the war dragged on would mean it was still the standard issue of the Wehrmacht until their surrender, with an estimated 14 million being produced by the time production ceased in 1945. The Kar 98K would also become adopted in the sniper role for the Germans. Despite the Germans initially not fielding sniper rifles, due to a misguided belief that they had become irrelevant. Many scopes of varying magnifications would be strapped to the Kar 98K over the course of the war, but the most common would be the 4 times magnified ZF-39 scope with around 132,000 sniper variants of the rifle being produced by the war's end. The MP40 would serve as their submachine gun of choice, and is possibly the most iconic German infantry weapon to be used during the Second World War. Popularized by Western post-war filmmaking, and a recognizable sight to anyone that's become even slightly interested in this period of history. Its commonality in media isn't inaccurate, however, as the MP40 would accompany the Kar 98K as the secondary standard issue weapon for the German infantry, with production ramping up significantly in the wake of German experiences at Stalingrad against Soviet troops equipped with the PPSH-41. 1.1 million were produced by 1945, and the weapon is often purported to be vastly superior to the submachine guns of the Allies, but in reality was no more effective in combat or statistically successful than the American Thompson or even the lead pipe the British were calling a submachine gun that was the Sten. Chambered in 9x19mm Luger, the German name at that time for what is commonly known as 9x19mm Parabellum, the MP40 feeds from 32 round box magazines and the design would become quite influential with the Americans using captured MP40s to help design their M3 grease gun, along with the folding stock being incorporated into the AK-47 to create the AKS-47. This submachine gun would also remain in use with insurgent forces across the globe in the early years of the Cold War, as the US and Soviet Union began funding and supplying weapons to such forces post-1945. Two other weapons I need to mention at this point are the Gewehr 43 and Sturmgewehr 44, or I'll have some very angry people in my comments. The Gewehr 43 was Germany's second attempt at making a semi-automatic rifle fit for standard issue, the first attempt being the Gewehr 41, which proved to be quite unreliable, but the Gewehr 43 would turn out to be a much more successful rifle, firing the same round as the Kar 98K out of 10 round detachable box magazines, and being accurate to around the same distance. But the design wouldn't enter production until 1943, 
and Germany's industrial capability would soon begin collapsing as the Allies closed in, resulting in only 400,000 being produced before the Third Reich fell. The STG-44 would fall victim to a similar problem, though it was a much more advanced weapon. The Sturmgewehr is credited as being the first true mass-produced assault rifle, and served as part of the design inspiration for the most produced assault rifle to date, the AK-47, along with serving as the foundation for post-war German designs such as the G3. It would be one of the first weapons to utilise an intermediate cartridge, namely the 792 by 33 mm Kurtz round, as well as being fully automatic and feeding from a 30 round box magazine. But production issues in Germany would result in a similar amount being produced as the Gewehr 43. The rifle itself wouldn't make much of an impact on the war, however, with the British and Americans being critical of its design citing a flimsy receiver, its bulkiness, tendency to jam, and unwieldy nature in automatic fire, though it was noted to be quite accurate. In their machine gun role, the Germans would employ the first designs of a new type of machine gun, the General Purpose Machine Gun, or GPMG, the first of which being the MG34, which itself was produced by a complete novice in firearms design. Chambered again in 792 by 57 mm Mauser, and feeding from either belts or 50 round drums, it was by no means a bad machine gun design, but would be replaced by the cheaper and faster to produce MG42 in the early years of the war. The MG42 was very similar to the MG34, produced by the same man, Werner Gruner, and its differences were mainly in production methods and simplifications to the weapon but the MG42 would become most notable for its dramatically increased rate of fire, being able to dispense 1200 rounds per minute. Not only did this make the weapon exceptionally dangerous to go up against, but it took a massive psychological toll on the Allies, with the American War Department even making a training film to try and combat it. And the MG42 would gain a number of nicknames by the war's end, such as Hitler's Buzzsaw and the Linoleum Ripper. Some 500,000 MG34s would be produced along with another 400,000 MG42s by the war's end, but the MG42 would remain in service and become the basis for a number of post-war machine gun designs, most notably the MG3 and MG74, as well as being re-chambered and trialled with the Americans, but this program would end as a failure, the Americans developing and later adopting a GPMG of their own, known as the M60. The machine guns were both operated by three-man machine gun crews, featuring one gunner, one loader, and one ammunition carrier, with the rest of the squad focusing on flushing enemy forces into the MG's line of fire. The German infantrymen, if issued a handgun, would receive either the Walther P38 or Luger P08, both chambered in 9x19mm Luger and both feeding from 8 round magazines. The P38 was designed as an easier to produce alternative to the Luger, which had been in service since the start of the 20th century, but the handgun wouldn't enter mass production until 1940, months after the Germans had already invaded Poland and begun the Second World War, meaning the Luger would remain in service and production through 1943. Despite the Germans trying to replace the Luger for most of the war, the Americans were particularly infatuated with the P-08, the handgun becoming a highly sought-after trophy as the Allies began pushing the Germans back in Europe, though this would become known to the Germans who would occasionally rig mines or improvised explosives to seemingly discarded Lugers to draw in these trophy hunters. Both handguns would remain in service in the post-war years, but would be largely replaced by the 1970s, with the P-38 influencing the design of the now famous Beretta Model 92. The Italians, referred to by Winston Churchill as Europe's soft underbelly, were fielding the Carcano Model 1891, 
a full-size bolt-action rifle from the tail end of the 19th century as their standard issue rifle. Similar to pretty much everyone but the Americans who wanted to be different and used the semi-automatic M1 Garand. The Garand is of note here though, as it uses the same loading system as the Carcano, an on-block clip. With the Carcano using an on-block loaded into a 6 round internal magazine, using the 65 by 52 mm Carcano round. Though some Italian troops on the Russian front would initially be fielding the 735 by 51 mm Carcano chambered variant. This variant would be shipped to Finland for their winter war with the Soviets, and the Finns absolutely hated it, and would often ditch the Italian rifle for captured Soviet arms instead. Some 2 to 3 million Carcanos were produced, with large amounts being captured by Germany after Italy surrendered, and became the standard issue for the incredibly tragic German Volkssturm, as a desperate attempt to delay the inevitable in the later stages of the war. As a result of being part of Italian World War II history, the Carcano remained largely unknown to the lazy historian that ignores the aspects of the Axis forces that weren't Japan or Germany. But it would shoot, literally, to global infamy in 1963, when it would be the weapon supposedly used by Lee Harvey Oswald to assassinate American President John F. Kennedy. The Italian military themselves wouldn't provide specialist sniper training, and as a result never formally adopted a sniper rifle, though some troops would equip their rifles with scopes throughout the war. In their submachine gun role, the Italians would employ the Beretta Model 38, which is considered one of the more refined submachine gun designs of World War II, especially when compared to the hastily constructed Sten or M3 grease gun. In service since 1938, the Beretta had been proliferated in small numbers throughout the entirety of the Italian military forces, including in its colonies, and the weapon would continue to be in service until the mid-1970s in various countries. The M38 is chambered for the Italian 9x19 M38 ammunition, which is actually different to the 9x19 Parabellum you're probably familiar with being slightly more powerful and accurate at longer ranges, and would feed into the weapon from 30 round box magazines. Both German and Allied forces would reportedly use captured Berettas throughout the war, along with it becoming the primary arm of the short-lived Italian Social Republic, the German-controlled northern Italian puppet state established after Italy's surrender in 1943. The Italian's machine gun of choice would follow with the common reputation of the Italian military in World War II, being generally useless and disliked by almost everyone. They would use the Fusil Mitrigad... The, the, the Breda Model 30, and it had about as many problems as you would expect. For one, the machine gun, let me remind you, this was a machine gun, was fed from 20 round stripper clips which often required oil for them to actually load the weapon correctly, and its closed bolt design meant that the weapon would heat up incredibly quickly, along with having a harder time cooling down. Two obvious glaring problems in a light machine gun design. The Breda was notoriously unreliable, often jamming in combat and being difficult to fix in the field, especially when the internal magazine would sustain even minor damage, which would become commonplace as the war dragged on. Thankfully for the rest of the world, less than 50,000 of the Breda were produced before it was finally buried in 1945, and only a handful of nations have had the misfortune of using this machine gun. But to their credit, the Italians did the best with what they had, and Italian infantrymen reportedly became very proficient with rapidly loading the small clips into the Breda with every infantryman trained to do so. For their handgun, the Italians would again turn to Beretta, who had been supplying their Model 1934 to the Italian military since 1935, and around a million would be produced in total. The Beretta feeds from seven round box magazines, and uses the 9mm Corto cartridge. But this is not the 9mm you're familiar with, it's the Italian designation for what's more commonly known as 380 ACP, 
Similar to the German Luger, the Beretta would become a sought-after item by Allied soldiers, this handgun more popular with the British, with many returning to Britain as war trophies. One of these war trophy Berettas would wind up in India in the late 1940s, where it would be used by Hindu nationalist Natharam Godsi in his assassination of Mahatma Gandhi. Why are all the Italian weapons assassinating people in like the Cold War? What the fuck was going on? In the Pacific Theatre, the Japanese would field the relatively new bolt-action Arasaka Type 99 as their standard issue rifle, a design in production since 1939. The rifle was essentially the same as their previous Type 38, which had entered service in 1906, but was rechambered for the 7.7x58mm Arasaka round as a result of its superior performance compared to the Type 38 6.5x50mm Arasaka during the Second Sino-Japanese War in the 1930s. The Type 99 was intended to replace the Type 38 entirely after that conflict, but not enough were produced to do so before the Japanese had already begun their Pacific conquest meaning the Japanese infantry was an unorganised mix of similar rifles with the same 5 round capacity but with drastically different cartridges, causing significant logistical difficulties throughout the war. 3.5 million of the Type 99 would be produced, on top of the 2 million Type 38s which had been in production since the early years of the 20th century, with a number being captured by the Americans and brought back to the US as war trophies. Many of these captured rifles have been somewhat defaced, with the Imperial Japanese chrysanthemum often scratched off by the Japanese themselves, seen as an act to protect the honour of the Emperor. Both rifles would be modified to fill a sniping role, but the Type 38 conversion, known as the Type 97 sniper rifle, was much more common, featuring a lighter stock and a 2.5 times magnified scope, and around 20,000 of these would be produced. Unlike every other major power of the war, the Japanese wouldn't field submachine guns in large numbers at any point during the conflict, but their submachine guns of choice would be a modified Beretta Model 38 and the Type 100, which Japan would only ever have around 10,000 of both designs, mainly due to the Imperial Japanese tactics not having much of a need for a submachine gun. Submachine gun development was not seen as a priority and was rather underfunded, and as a result the Type 100 would be largely based on the Bergman MP18, a World War I era design. Production of the Type 100 would be ordered to be increased in 1944, as the Japanese began to realise their need for a submachine gun to be able to beat back the Americans but by then, Japan's industrial capacity and material stockpiles were nowhere near enough to build the number Japan needed. By the end of the war, the Type 100 would be in service in two main forms, the early war version known as the Type 100-40 and the later war version known as the Type 100-44, both chambered in 8x22mm Nambu and feeding from 30 round box magazines. Similar to the Type 99 rifle, the Japanese light machine gun for the Second World War, oddly enough named the Type 99 light machine gun, would also be a rechambered version of a previous service weapon, and would also not fully replace the weapon it was intended to due to issues with wartime production. The Type 99 chambered in 7.7x58mm Arasaka would serve alongside the Type 96 and Type 11 both of which were chambered in the 6.5x50mm Arasaka, the Type 96 and 99 both being descendants of the Type 11, and both fed from 30 round box magazines while the Type 11 was loaded with stripper clips. These machine guns were all regarded as fairly good designs, being reliable enough and able to withstand substantial external damage but the Type 96 and Type 11 6.5mm round was noted to be much less effective against cover than both the American 30 6 and the Type 99 7.7mm round. All three of these weapons would remain in use 
long after Imperial Japan fell, becoming a common sight in the insurgencies and revolutions that spread across Asia in the early years of the Cold War, such as in China, Vietnam, and Korea. The Japanese would employ the Nambu Type 14 pistol in their handgun role, with around 400,000 produced over the course of the war. Though pistols served more as a status symbol than as a tool for combat in Japan at this time. The Nambu is chambered in the same 8x22mm Nambu cartridge as the Type 100 submachine gun, feeds from 8 round box magazines, and looks visually similar to the German Luger. Similar to the Luger, the Nambu would become a sought after war trophy, with many American soldiers capturing the handgun. Though many Japanese soldiers began destroying or throwing them into the ocean to prevent the Americans from taking what they saw as their emperor's property. Two of these American captured Nambus would be duplicated by one Bill Ruger in 1949, and would serve as part of the basis for a new handgun he was developing, which would become the Ruger Standard, the first product of the now famous Ruger firearm manufacturer based in Connecticut. As with most Japanese weapons though, the quality of the Nambu would decline noticeably over the course of the war, due to the need to produce more weapons even as Japan's industrial capability and amount of resources began to falter. If you've made it this far, thank you for watching. I really appreciate it, and I hope you enjoyed the video. The video idea voted by you all for next week is a remake of my Colt 1911 video, and you'll be able to see the vote for the following video in the community tab on my channel page, which will be open until next week's video goes live. This week I'm narrowing the options down to just two, that being between a video debunking the myth of German technological superiority in World War II, or a video debunking the Allied Wave myth from World War II. So head on over there to make your pick, but also feel free to suggest other video topics you'd like to see me cover, Thank you again for watching, if you're new subscribe, if you enjoyed the video feel free to like it, and I'll see you in the next one.